Brothers and sisters, I come to you this morning in an unusual position for a preacher. I am not really sure what to say. <laughs> we are in week 12 or so of lockdown, dealing with a virus that has claimed almost as many American lives as World War I, a number that we will almost certainly surpass in the weeks and months to come. 26 million Americans and counting have lost their jobs and we are only just beginning to reckon with the long-term economic fallout of this crisis. And over the past few days, cities throughout the country have been set on fire with anger and heartbreak because it turns out that even in the context of a global pandemic, when literally all of humanity is united together in a fight against a non-human enemy, that even then, the senseless killing of black men by white police officers continues. More than anything else this morning, I'm sad. And I miss you. Being a priest doesn't really make sense without you. I know you're still there <laughs> through the other side of this camera, but if I'm honest, this, it's not the same. The camera is not as kind as you are. Sure, the camera does not make passive aggressive comments about me not calling them on their birthday, but the camera does not come forward to hold out their hands to receive the Eucharist. The camera does not sing. The camera does not share its struggles with me. It does not pray. And I am sad that we are forced to do church like this. I'm sad that some of you are living alone and I can't visit you. That some of you are having surgery and I can't be there to hold your hand. I'm sad that I can't sit in a circle and wonder what this story is really about with our godly play kids. I'm also sad that most of the jobs that governments deem essential in the context of a global crisis also happen to not pay very much money. I'm sad that small business owners in our community are now put in a position of having to choose between their own safety and their own livelihoods. I am sad that we can live in a society where a global crisis can cause tens of millions of people to lose their jobs completely while at the same time our society's billionaires make billions more. How do we live in a world that has rules that allow such things as that. And I am heartbroken, wrecked by the images that we have seen over the past few days. I am haunted by the scene of George Floyd gasping the words, I can't breathe. Haunted by the fact that I'm hardly even surprised that it happened. I am haunted by pictures of white protesters throwing bricks through windows while protest organizers beg them to stop destroying stuff through their bullhorns. I'm haunted by images of reporters and cameramen and journalists arrested and fired upon with tear gas and rubber bullets by people whose job it is definitionally to keep the public safe. I'm haunted by pictures of police who are already armed like a military, who find yet even more things to use as weapons, like bicycles and vehicles. I don't know what to say, and I don't know what to do. I know today is the Feast of Pentecost. I know that on the day of Pentecost, God, by the Spirit, descended on the disciples and gave them the gift of speaking new languages. I know that there was fire on that day too. And I think that is my prayer for today, a, symbol, a simple and humble one, both for me as your preacher and for us as a church, that the Spirit would descend upon us and give us new languages with which we can understand, new words that we can hear and new words that we can speak. We need new words and new ways to process and solve these deep and systemic troubles that our world faces at the moment. I had a teacher who was fond of saying, you can only act in a world you can see and you can only see 
a world that you can say. You can only act in a world that you can see, and you can only see a world that you can say. It feels like all of our existing words that we're using to process these crises, all those words just shunt us all into different categories that don't fit, trying to convince us that what's happening are still conflicts between liberals and conservatives, or Republicans and Democrats, or urban versus rural, or rich versus poor, or public versus private. Those words don't work anymore, and they are no longer helpful. We need new words so that we can see new places, so we can begin to act to make the changes that we all know that we need. My prayer is that a new spirit-infused vocabulary will emerge from the rubble of what our world is going through right now. And the thing is, I actually do think it's possible. This pandemic, despite bringing unmitigated disaster and tragedy into our world, also represents a unique opportunity in our lives. Because the combination of unprecedented tragedy and the removal of our typical distractions like work or commutes or live sports or movie theaters, the removal of that and the bringing of tragedy has given us a context to do some very basic thinking as a society and as individuals. It gives us as a church an opportunity to consider again what we really want the world to know us for. Deeply entrenched assumptions that felt impossible to overcome even 12 weeks ago are all of the sudden up for grabs. It seems to me that this is part of what is fueling the intensity of the protests and riots over the past few days. Of course, the killing of George Floyd is tragic in its own right, but in this moment, that coming right now, it has also made many of us re-remember that back when things were normal, things actually weren't all that great. And actually, it turns out that we don't have a lot of interest in going back there. When we emerge on the other side of this, we want to emerge into something that's better than that, into something that's different. These protests and riots are beautiful and awful and complicated, deeply complicated. But despite all the complexity, what we are seeing is a declaration of emergency from below, from people, from ordinary people like you and me. We are asking ourselves some very basic questions about how we want our society to be ordered and what kinds of values we want to persist into this new future. But here's the thing. If we want things to change, if we want to be given new languages, we have to be open to the Spirit working in our lives. I have to be open to it. We have to be open to change. We have to be open to listening for new languages from people that we didn't know prior to now. We have to seek those things and those people out. Just a few months ago here at St. Mark's, even though it feels like it was years ago, in the month of February, we started an important conversation in Sunday school about black history in America, and specifically about the legacy of white identity, since we are, by and large, a white church. We learned in that class, first of all, that being open to the Spirit's work in our lives is not something that is generally easy or comfortable. Actually, if we want things to change, we probably need to change the way that we view this Pentecost analogy in the first place. We probably need to first see ourselves not in the shoes of the disciples who were the ones miraculously speaking the new languages, but as the others who were gathered there to hear those words, the others who were gathered into Jerusalem, who in that moment, on that day, heard the gospel as if for the first time. Remember, the Spirit gave the disciples the ability to speak other languages, not just for the sport of it. It was because for the feast, the entire world was represented in Jerusalem. People from everywhere were watching, and God gave them the ability to speak in all the languages that were represented there, so that those people could hear about God's deeds of power, so that they could hear the gospel so that they could hear the good news that the God who first raised Israel out of slavery in Egypt has now raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. 
We remain isolated, I know, for the most part. But in another sense, we are all gathered together in this country watching in a way that we never have been before. I don't know how you feel today. Maybe with me, you're just overwhelmed with sadness and having a hard time getting past that to any second emotion. Maybe you're filled with anger and maybe that's spilling over into rage. Maybe you're just tired. Maybe you're still distracted. Maybe you're in pain. Maybe you yourself feel under attack. But as new languages emerge from the rubble of our present crises, I invite you to join me in praying that we might hear God in those new languages and that over time we come to learn to speak them ourselves. Resist falling into the simple categories that the world wants to shunt us into. We are Christians. So we should be on the lookout for where we see the gospel bubbling up in new and surprising places. What do we recognize as God's deeds of power in our world today? There is an overwhelming amount of pain and sadness in our world. But the images over the past few days have displayed a lot of beauty too, both here in our church and around the country. I wonder where you see those pictures of hope. I wonder where you see those snippets of the gospel that defy simplistic categorization. Let me end by speaking just a little for myself so I can give you somewhere to start looking. I see that hope. I see the gospel in a group of men here at St. Mark's who, instead of canceling their weekly Tuesday Kirby Lane breakfast, simply relocated it to Jim Clark's driveway. I see it to those of you who have dedicated hours of your weeks in the last few months to calling households of people in our community that you've never met in person before, just to tell them that we haven't forgotten about them. I see it in the generosity of this congregation, many of you now recognizing that you have been blessedly immune to the economic effects of this crisis, have turned over your government stimulus checks to us to redistribute to those who we know are in need. I see it in those of you who have taken this pandemic as an opportunity for your own spiritual renewal, to instill new habits of prayer and study. Could it be that this season will lead to a revival in the Episcopal Church? <laughs> I see hope and I see the gospel. I see new languages emerging in the creativity that we've seen by protesters. <laughs> who rather than destroying buildings and cars in Austin, chose instead to stand across I-35 and stop traffic temporarily, to remind newcomers to our city that the building of that highway destroyed some of the very few African-American neighborhoods Austin had to begin with, or the creativity of protesters in Denver, hundreds of which gathered together and laid down on their stomachs on the lawn of the Capitol building and in unison for nine minutes, put their hands behind their backs and repeated, I can't breathe. I see it in the faces of the black police officers standing serenely and wordlessly while white protesters scream in their face. I see it in Flint and Camden, where cops and protesters march together arm in arm. I see it in the groups of Amish people holding signs that say, thou shalt not kill, and singing hymns. I see it in the face of George Floyd, who, like Jesus, died of asphyxiation at the hands of state-sanctioned violence, and who, like Jesus, will one day rise again. Come, Holy Spirit, we will try to listen. Amen.